So, today we have yet another episode of our regular lecture series featuring the eminent marine biologist Asha DeVos. And uh, this is one of a series of lectures that the WNPS, the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society, conducts every month here at the BMICH. It's usually a packed audience. We cover a wide range of topics. Today we are discussing whales, next month it's insects. We have covered photography, lichens, and all aspects of the fauna and flora in Sri Lanka. Our main aspiration of this is to increase awareness levels among the Sri Lankan public on key issues to do with conservation, the challenges that Sri Lanka is facing, possible alternate means that we could take, and as part of that, we also enable our young uh, nature lovers through the youth wing and through our district reps and other subcommittees to engage in direct conservation activities all over Sri Lanka. So we encourage more people to join us, become members of the society, read our publications and do your own part to help conserve the fauna and flora of this beautiful country. How we have started our reforestation program. If you just look at this uh, slide, the population versus forest density statistics of our country. If you go through 1881, the strength, uh, the population is 2.7 million and 82% of the forest and 18% of the projects on other activities, uh, the land reserved for the construction of houses and etc. And if you go through and see the 2012, the present status of our land and the forest. World Health Organization in 2010 rated Sri Lanka as the fourth highest deforesting country in the world. The present commander of the army, Lieutenant General Mahesh Sainanayaka, having seen this problem, uh, the army, after completing war, we, we were focused on the nation building. Two-third of the armies, one-third of the armies on duty, the other group is on training. The third part is on national development projects are to cover and we are still, we are continuing our nation building program. In that, this is one area the command of the army looked at and he has started Turulia uh, between Api. Uh, project. 
phase one we have started in southern highway 2017 month of august the second phase we have started in vilpattu why we have selected vilpattu in social media a lot of people discuss about this issue due to resettlement of villages after completing war they have cleared 8.5 square kilometers in vilpattu jungle these are the area we have concerned we are uh, we have started our project turuli avenue in api tarakpuli marishakkadi hunasnagar sinanagar palasottikandal this is uh, north of uh, vilpattu sanctuary project the government the resettlement ministry organized constructed 5096 houses and uh, they have cleared the important area portion of the vilpattu sanctuary during our search operations conducted recent past after 21st april incident we found the 592 houses abandoned when i inquired with the uh, division of secretary and the gram melgar said uh, they have left these houses last 3 3 and a half years they have, they have not occupied these houses just abandoned yet the government has started another housing project recent past so we have stopped that we have requested uh, the government as a military force we stop that uh, project uh, i mean this is not required if you take the mana district there are a lot of people they are seeking for a house the poor families are there yet the government or uh, the officials who are living there responsible people they didn't look at this 592 houses how they are going to distribute how we are going to utilize so we are in a position as a military force we have started this reforesting program we have uh, uh, already we have planted around 5000 plants we are maintaining around 30000 uh, nursery plants nursery and i will tell you what is required from the public how they are going to support us to continue this project forty six point five acres we have already planted around five thousand plants and another two hundred eighty one acres available for reforestation these are the area replanted uh, we have four we have selected uh, uh, four site uh, for replanted site in brickal uh, yet to replant there are we have selected another six areas these are the proposals that we can uh, bring to your eye notice Uh, to continue our program or uh, the our project the proposal is we have allocated half a acre block we have surveyed and uh, if you want to go to go into details to know about uh, about this our project after this uh, guest speaker's lecture we are available till 8 o'clock 8:30 you can uh, come to us we will educate you how to support us how to uh, uh, help us to continue with our project we have open up a account thoroughly in api account is opened uh, and it, it, in uh, people's bank uh, mana 
We are expecting uh, the donors and producers to donate uh, financial assistance to continue our project. For more details, the 542 Brigade Commander Colonel Ravi Hera, who is responsible for the ground duties in this sector, and Colonel Bhaiptia Jayavira, the uh, General Officer, Grade 1 uh, Coordinating Officer in 54 Division, and uh, Colonel G.S. Ruan Munipura, and Colonel Chaminda Arachi is available. You can note down these numbers, and we, we, we have opened up a uh, website it is on process within another few weeks time we are going to introduce this website so you we'll, you can go through this website uh, and uh, we'll, uh, you can get uh, all details about the project ladies and gentlemen once again i'm uh, thanking uh, wildlife and uh, Nature Protection Society inviting us and to just to educate. If you uh, to educate your this uh, podium is you know it is just a five to ten minutes is not enough. So you can uh, contact these officers and you can visit Belpatu area and see what is going on. It is very uh, uh, very much required. Is that, that dry zone is you know the sort of water. We are seeking assistance from uh, uh, the public to support us uh, to organize a drip irrigation water system. Thank you very much uh, for uh, pay kind your attention uh, for just a short brief about uh, uh, our project. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to get settled. And uh, thank you very much for coming in early. Today was a rough. They've just been concluding sessions in Jaffna, Hatton, Udawalawe, all over the country. And the beauty of it was that it was young people traveling out there to educate young people about the need for conservation. So I think uh, that's what we were striving to get going. And we need more kids joining, so anybody who feels young, uh, Watch out for the green gang who's uh, walking all over in these green t-shirts, talk to them, sign up and become part of the new youth brigade because all of this is being done so that we leave something behind for that next generation. So thanks to our sponsors, firstly Nations Trust Bank, they've been doing a lot of work, not just with us and the low risk and all, but with the youth wing as well and with the veteran walk. We have uh, NDB, NDB, Sampath, Ajitadi Costa, TJ, Bandix, JK, and Abans, among many others who are starting to join and work with us and we encourage and there are a number of uh, leading corporate uh, representatives in the room. We see how you can support us on you know, a lot of these different initiatives. Um, some of you would have seen, many of you would have got the 125th uh, commemorative edition. We don't have a lot of them unfortunately, so there's just I think a uh, hundred or two left which will be up for sale, so I would urge anybody interested in that magazine to grab that because that's a limited edition, pretty much a collector, collector's edition. Uh, we have five slots left for Vilpatu later on this month. Anybody interested, 
uh, sign up the moment you go out because usually that program gets uh, sold out and we don't take the other stipulated numbers for our monthly excursions. Right. Uh, kids, 18th August, the next wetland walk. So anybody wanting to join that program again, uh, please uh, sign up outside. Members are free, but they must register. Right. Uh, a lot of interesting work going on in Atidia with the Green Isle project, trying to win back that wetland habitat and recreate what was initially there. So that's a five-year project. We are doing a bit of a ceremonial launch on the 7th of August. Anybody who would like to be there, please let us know. You're more than welcome. And you know, hopefully we'll gradually, step at a time, work towards restoring Artidia to something that it used to be the bird paradise that you know many of us grew in. But it's not just birds, it's an entire ecosystem restoration project. CJ and the Sava team, thank you for all the creatives and work you do for us. And um, next month, uh, we are dwelling in the you know, land of insects, hidden treasures of Sri Lanka. So that's our uh, lecture next month. That's by Professor Nirmali Talabakta and Professor Jayanti Edirisimha. Right? Uh, so I'm sure many of you will be there next month as well. So it's not just about a single topic, you know, we cover a lot of stuff. New members, I see a lot of non-members in the room. We invite more and more people to join up and become a WNPS member, benefit from the work we do and mainly support us. There's also an interesting coffee table book uh, on this topic, insects, uh, which will be available next month, um, 8,000 rupees, so that's much less than the publication price, again, very specially for this group. A couple of uh, more commercial spins, just to close it out, which is uh, do help us by picking up some of the t-shirts outside for the 125th anniversary, there's some ties, um, and also uh, we see increasing numbers of people going to our bungalows in Udavalve and Vilpattu, uh, so continue to do that, right? But main thing is we need more help. We need more volunteers. We need more people in the subcommittees. We work on cats, on marine, on conservation, on legal, we're fighting the government on a couple of cases, so we partner the government and we fight them as well. And that's that's the, that's coexistence, right? So uh, we need help. So if there are any people who can contribute in time, money, knowledge, anything, please let us know, and you know that will inspire us to take on more. Uh, finally, something slightly different: Ecofriend Sri Lanka. They've created a mobile app, right? Which uh, you know. Uh, Android on uh, Apple, you can download that. But essentially, for 200 bucks a month, you can get your e-waste picked up, and they will sort it and you know take care of that. Now that's a huge problem for a lot of people, right? So that's why we thought we'd try to uh, support that initiative because we are also concerned about the future because e-waste is a big issue in developed countries, and before it becomes a problem here, we have an opportunity to do that, right? So. Let me get on to why we are all here, right? Secret life of Sri Lankan giants, Dr. Asadivas. So, uh, it's tough to justify an introduction to a personality who's, you know, the reason that everyone's in the room. Let me try to do some of the honors. At a comparatively young age, Dr. Divas has truly earned the accolade of being a legend in Sri Lanka's marine conservation. Marine biologist, as we all know, right? Uh, she has degrees from uh, St Andrews, Oxford, and Western Australia. One and only Sri Lanka to have a PhD in marine mammal research, and is the first Pew Fellow in marine conservation from Sri Lanka. So this thing goes on, right? I have pages here. No, we're not going to read that, but uh, you know you are in distinguished company, right? And uh, she's also set up her own um, uh, non-profit, Ocean Swell, right? And I'm sure Asha will talk a little lot more about the project work that she's doing and all of that. Um, she's also led a lot of key research publications and you know been showcased internationally by Channel 7 in Australia, BBC, New York Times, CNN, Wired UK, Ted, uh, Chris, Good, Natio. Um, I'm skipping names, so we all know what she's all about. We are really proud of her. And um, she's also been listed in BBC's 100 Women uh, in 2018 for being 
some of the most inspiring and influ influential women around the world, uh, one of the superstars of Asia's sustainability, and you know the list goes on, right? Uh, as a footnote, of course, uh, we have uh, one of our past presidents, as he was, who's, uh, you know, who's been one of the leading pillars of the society also, who's, uh, I'm sure, contributed in many ways to lead along this journey. So... Asha, Asha, one Asha? Asha? Yeah, well, Jan's reminding me what she will read. I thought she... Proud. Won't mind, you know, using some of the aisles and uh, allowing some of the elder crowd to probably occupy a few more seats, if possible. And uh, with that, sorry, Asha, back to you. Is this working? Yep. Can you all hear me at the back? Loud? Not loud? Front can hear me. Back is either sleeping already or getting a few thumbs ups. Okay, okay, great, okay, okay, but that's what I want, okay. Yeah, all good. Hello everyone up there as well. Uh, first of all, thank you, good evening everybody and thank you obviously so, so much for being here today. Um, I will probably be blind in my right eye by the end of this, but anyway, um, I, it's amazing. I, like my favorite thing in the world is storytelling and alongside that my favorite thing in the world is talking to a packed out audience. And you have all really allowed me to fulfill a couple of my dreams tonight. So thank you for being here. Thank you for braving the security lines, the checks, the, I don't know, the traffic that you can share with the world. So you can also engage and love the ocean the way I love the ocean. So today I'm going to talk about the secret. Oh, but before I start, I want, can all the kids put your hands up? All the kids in the room. Kids. We've got some kids who are not sure how old they are, but we have some real kids also. Okay, so kids in the room, all of you who just put your hands up, what I want you to know is that tonight is your night, okay? I love seeing the uncles and the aunties and the archies and the siyas and the akkis and all of that, but it's you guys who are going to make a difference in the world, and so I'm here today to share what I have, what my knowledge is, so all of you can go back home Tell one other person about one thing you learned tonight, okay? That's what I'm asking of you. Remember, listen, learn something, and go share, okay? So you guys are my ocean heroes tonight. Is that good? Can you do that for me? Ocean heroes? Very quiet ocean heroes. Anyway, we'll keep moving on. Hopefully by the end, you all will be really enthusiastic, okay? So tonight, I'm going to talk about the secrets of Sri Lanka's giants. I'm sure most of you thought that I was going to talk about blue whales. How many of you thought I was going to talk about blue whales? Hands up, and like maybe she's talking about sperm whales. And then of course here I've thrown in a picture of an elephant as well. So I'm truly going to talk about Sri Lanka's giants. And to do that, I'm going to weave the story around sperm whales, okay? So sperm whales are my core species tonight. This talk is in three parts. The first part is I'm gonna look at the sperm whales in Sri Lanka, comparing them to blue whales in Sri Lanka. Then I'm gonna take the sperm whales and compare them to a population of sperm whales in Dominica. And what I want to say is, I'm happy for you guys to write about what you're hearing tonight, do social media, but the only part I will ask you all not to um, put out there is the part where I'm comparing our sperm whales with sperm whales in Dominica, because it's unpublished data, it's a work in process, it's a brand new project. I'm bringing it to you guys because you have all been awesome and turned up tonight, and this is my gift to you, giving something special that nobody else in the world knows about. So we're going to keep this as that part a secret in this room, okay? So no sharing beyond this, but take the information and be excited and follow the journey as it develops, okay? And the last part, I'm going to talk about sperm whales in Sri Lanka and talk, them, talk about them or sperm whales in general and compare them to elephants, okay? Um, I think I'm echoing a bit. Okay, so many of you know me as the blue whale girl. Many of you also know me as the whale poop girl, yes? <laughs> And I own these titles, I'm all good with that. But what many of you won't know is that I started my career in love with sperm whales. So this is my undergraduate thesis that I wrote in 2002 about sperm whale acoustics uh, based on sperm whales in the Azores and the Gulf of Mexico. 
And I used to spend endless hours with my earphones on, listening to them chatter. And I thought, wow, these are amazing animals. I want to dedicate my life to studying them, okay? And I was a completely mesmerized by them. And in fact, the first large whale species that I ever saw was also a sperm whale. Because after my undergraduate, after I wrote that thesis, I was working on data that other scientists had collected. And so I wanted to then go see something out there in the world. And some of you might know I lived in New Zealand in a tent for about six months of my life doing volunteer work in marine conservation. And at that time, I went off to the South Island of New Zealand to Kaikura, where it's super famous for their sperm whale whale watching. And on the water, I remember seeing this sperm whale and thinking, wow, like, we live on a planet with these amazing, slightly awkward looking, but amazing animals, right? And I was, I was like, wow, this is amazing. So of course my love now just got deeper and I'm still convinced I'm going to spend my life studying them. And then at this time I got onto a whale research vessel that was navigating the world, uh, circumnavigating the world, stopped in the Maldives and Sri Lanka and that's where I got on. This was the Odyssey. Some of you may know that I, that's where my kind of journey began. And um, so they were, there we were tracking sperm whales acoustically. So we had an underwater microphone or a hydrophone in the water. We'd listen for the whales, we'd find the whales, and then we'd take these tiny biopsy samples that would allow us to understand how the pollutants in the ocean were affecting the whales, okay? So because we were collecting their sounds, we'd play them on the loudspeaker in the boat. And it was, you know, a cacophony. And we just listened to the sounds day in, day out for months. And for me, it was just the most beautiful sounds. This is where I'm going to go, right? Like, I'm going to do a PhD in this stuff. Here's the data. I've got everything set up. But then you all also probably know that I got distracted. I got distracted by an aggregation of blue whales and a floating pile of whale poop, right? And some of you know that story. But for those of you who don't, I saw this whale poop off the southeast coast of Sri Lanka. And I was very excited, and I know not many of you would be excited by poo, but I am. It's kind of in my personality. Um, and so I basically, what happened was by seeing the poop, I knew blue whales were supposed to go to cold waters to feed. My professors and my textbooks said they go to Antarctica to feed. There's more food. Why would these giants in the ocean try to feed in tropical waters? That's what everyone told me. And here I was with evidence that they were feeding poop right off the south coast of Sri Lanka, as warm and as tropical as you can get, right? And so at that point, I thought, this is my eureka moment. These whales are doing something completely different. They're bending the rules. They're destroying what my textbooks and my professors told me. This is what I'm dedicating my life to. So there I was, right? You might think I'm an unfocused individual, but I spent 10 years with these blue whales, right? So there's a bit of dedication and commitment going on. So I spent, the next, I spent the next 10 years working on the Sri Lankan Blue Whale Project, really unraveling the mysteries. But the sperm whales were never far from my mind, right? I still always harbored them in my subconscious. I thought about them. But I also wanted to get into them and start researching them at a time that I had the right questions, the right questions that could drive conservation, the right questions and the right structure and the right support systems to make sure I wasn't just doing research for the sake of it, but I was having an impact. And that's really important to me, okay? So um, this opportunity, exactly this opportunity, came to me a few months ago. And I set off to the northwest coast of Sri Lanka with this amazing team, incredibly capable, amazing, experienced team. And there we launched the Sri Lankan, Blue Whale, uh, Sri Lankan Sperm Whale Project. And I was blown away because I realized I was in such a unique position because I was in a position to compare and contrast two giants in our oceans. It's not a common thing that you'll get researchers who have this grand opportunity. And here I was. And to just kickstart it all, look, up here I've got the tail flukes of the two different species. On the right-hand side, my right-hand side, your left-hand side, um, that's the blue whale. You can see that it's got a much more slender tail fluke. It's narrow, it's a bit more triangular, whereas the sperm whales have a broader tail fluke, right? So when we are on the ocean, this is one way that we can tell the difference between the species. Very, very characteristic. And blue whales, wow, they are the giants of our planet. When they exhale, 
that exhalation or that blow rises into the sky. It's tortical, it's magical, right? And they are baleen whales. So baleen whales are whales that use comb-like structures in their mouths to feed, okay? So they filter feed through our oceans. They open their mouths, they take a big gulp of what they want, they push out all the water, and then they swallow the little tiny shrimp that they feast on, okay? As all baleen whales have, which is humpback whales or right whales, all of them are baleen whales, they have two blowholes, two nostrils located on the tops of their heads, okay? So that's one of the distinguishing features of baleen whales. But then there's the sperm whales, right? The sperm whales, they're cute, they're like browny gray, they have wrinkles on their bodies, and when they exhale, it slants off onto the left-hand side. And the reason for that is sperm whales are toothed whales. They have teeth in their mouth, but only on the lower rung because of what they feed on. And as toothed whales all do, they have one blowhole, only one blowhole. So think about a dolphin, think about a killer whale. They all have one blowhole on the top of their heads. Sperm whales have funny shaped square heads. So their blowhole is actually located on the left hand side, which is why when they exhale, woof, off it goes onto the left hand side. So again, another feature that we can use to distinguish them when we are out on the water, right? I mean, they're also incredible creatures. They are the largest toothed whale species on our planet. Blue whales are the largest animal that's ever roamed our planet and the largest baleen whale species on our planet. And guess what, everyone? Here we are in Sri Lanka and in our waters just off our coastline lie these two giants. Think for a second what an absolute privilege it is for us to live on this planet side by side with these incredible creatures. And sadly, I think we take them for granted rather than celebrate them for the amazing things that they are. Blue whales, when they communicate, typically, so blue whales typically are very solitary animals, okay? You can come up front, please. There's lots of space. You don't have to come, um, hide out there. Come, come forward. So, so blue whales are, well, they aggregate. We do see them aggregating, but they aggregate in places that they're feeding, right? That's the only time you'll see lots of blue whales together, their own. And when they make noise, when they make their sounds, their sounds sound like a basically a, it's a roll, low rumble that sounds like a jet engine. And I'm going to try to play you a sound right now. Let's see. This is what always happens. I'm going to try to play you a sound right now. It worked just a little earlier. Everybody, if everyone looks at the audio room, it might start working. <laughs> okay, well, this is unfortunate. It's not working right now because it was working a minute ago. Volume? Oh, huh, why is it saying it's... Okay. I don't know why... Vo okay, volume's not working right now, which is super unfortunate. Ah. This is a blue whale. A low rumble. Right, it's like a jet engine. Can you feel it in your chest? It's the deepest call in all our oceans. They're the loudest animals on the planet. The irony is we don't hear them when we try to listen with our ears because it's such a low frequency that we can't hear it. It's not in our hearing range. But sperm whales, on the other hand, are not solitary animals, particularly in our parts of the world. They aggregate in these massive, you see them in these massive aggregations, and they roam around in our oceans. These are maternal groups. Grandmothers, mothers, children, they come together, they hang out together. Each unit is genetically connected. Grandmother, daughter, daughters, children. And then each, the units can come together from time to time and make these bigger groups. And that's what we see. But how do they keep themselves together when you have all these children running around? You need to be more conversational. And this is what the sperma sounds like. Let's do that part. 
There's a number of sperm whales here. You can hear them all talking at the same time. So much chatter, right? It's kind of, I think I'm a sperm whale. That's my spirit animal. Um, but, and so these animals have different ways of communicating. They, what we think of them as groups, they're so different in different species. And we have to learn to appreciate these differences. And blue whales, they've got to this gigantic size by feeding on some of the smallest things in our oceans. In fact, up here on this finger, you can see maybe a very tiny little shrimp. That is what blue whales feast on in our waters. How, they, how on earth do they get <laughs> so big? This is my enthusiasm just pouring out, by the way. How do they get so big? They get so big because they have learned to exploit these massive swarms. So these animals are tiny, but they're swarming creatures. The advantage is that they don't, they don't move actively in the ocean. They can't swim away when the blue whale's coming at them. They move passively with the currents. So the blue whale doesn't have to waste energy chasing after its prey. And it's there in massive swamps. So all it does is go after it, take a big gulp, and there you go. Push out the water, swallow all the krill. Right? Pretty simple, but amazing. Largest animal on the planet feasting on something that's smaller than your finger. Sperm whales, on the other hand, they dive much deeper. Blue whales will go to a few hundred meters deep. They'll hold their breath for 14 to 15 minutes. They don't need to go any deeper. These animals just need to go as deep as their food is, right? Otherwise, it's just a waste of energy. Sperm whales go deeper. They go to hundreds of meters, sometimes thousands of meters. They can stay down for an hour, hour and a half. And they've actually adapted to do that by being able to collapse their rib cages. And as they collapse their rib cages, their lungs get compressed. Before they dive, they exhale 90% of the air in their lungs. And off they go, down in the darkest depths of our oceans, where they feast on squid. They might even be battling with this squid. Who knows? It's so deep and dark down there, we do not know. But this is what we imagine happens. And they feast on this squid, and that has repercussions. Whatever you eat comes out the other side, right? Many of you must be accustomed to this photograph, because it's one that I'm very passionate about. Blue whale poop, right? Why is it red? They feed on shrimp. Digest comes out the other side. It's red in color. Sperm whales, on the other hand, out comes something more blacky brown. Why is that? They eat squid. Squid have ink. Gets digested, comes out the other side. That's what you get. As a scientist and as a, the whale poop girl, I am very obsessed with whale poop. And I collect samples for research. And here I'm showing you what I collect. So up here you'll see in this little uh, plastic container, I've got, there are these little brown things. Those are squid beaks. Squid, all squid have beaks. The good thing about the beaks is they're made of the same thing as your nails. So they're pretty like sturdy. They come out complete from the other side. They don't get digested. So what do I do? When I see it floating, I'm in there like a teddy bear, scooping it all up, collecting it, because I can use these squid beaks. I can look at the shape. I can look at the size. And we can start to look at what species these animals are feeding on. Really important for us to understand, because we want to know more about these animals so we can make sure we're protecting the resources they depend on. And on the other side, you have, again, blue whale poop, right? Very well. Everyone knows this photograph. If you don't, you should know this photograph, because it is the most beautiful poop in the animal kingdom, or any kingdom, for that matter. But you can see it's very different. It comes out much more digested. It's more powdery. For us to do work on their prey, we actually have to um, extract the DNA of the prey from this and then do stuff in the lab to identify what they're feeding on. And that's how we know that while blue whales all over the world feed on krill, the ones in our waters feed on shrimp. It doesn't matter if you know the difference or not. The point is they're doing something different. They're special, they're different. In our waters, we have a population that's adapted to exactly what's going on here, right? And the one common thing that all whale poop has is that it brings me immense joy. <laughs> this is me straight after collecting some samples. I'm really excited. My parents are less excited because I have a freezer that's dedicated to whale poo in the house. And 
I, I mean, there's no food in it, but I guess, you know, it's, it's a lot of whale poop for one person to ha have, right? And that what I think is also interesting is that these animals drive the behavior of, of us scientists sometimes. So here's a, here's a blue whale um, that, oh, sorry. You can see the blue whale comes up to the surface, takes the bread. It's preparing for its dive. It's preparing for its deep dive. Just listen. You can hear this clicking sound. Keep listening. many photographers in this room, you're probably very familiar with that sound. I'm wondering, and the rest of you are probably wondering what that machine gun fire is. It's not machine gun fire, it's my camera. And when I say it drives the behavior of the scientist, I, for me, when I want to take identification photographs, when I want to take pictures of these blue whales to, to identify which individual is there, I have to take pictures of either side and the tail fluke. Now you can see from the blue whales, they don't have a lot of big marks, permanent scars, nicks and cuts that we can use, right? Even when you see the tail fluke, it's pretty clean. There's not a lot going on there. So we use color a lot to identify the individuals. Distinct mottling patterns. When you're taking pictures of things like that, the light matters, the angle matters. So you take as many photographs as you can of that animal so that you might find at least one that's of use. So I was doing this on this boat when I was out with my friend doing sperm whale research and he was getting so annoyed with me. He was like, why do you have 40 pictures of this sperm whale? And I'm like, I need to get all the pictures for photo ID. And he's like, why? And as it turns out, with sperm whales, there's just one photograph of you need because they're one color all through their bodies. They don't have mottling patterns. And it's just their tail fluke that gives us any inkling of who the individual is. So you just need the picture of the animal when it's like this against the sky, and you got your ID photograph, right? So my interns are probably thrilled that we're now shifting to sperm whales because they don't have to sift through 1,500 photographs a day. Now they can have 10 photographs because we've only seen 10 individuals a day, right? It's intensive work, but, but they're a good, good bunch. Uh, if you're in here, you know you, who I'm talking about. Thank you for hard work. So now I'm going to go, we're moving away from the blue whales in Sri Lanka. I hope you got really excited about the fact that we have these giants in our oceans. Now I'm taking you across the world to Dominica in the West Indies. That's me with my friend Shane Gero. Dr. Shane Gero leads, uh, is the founder and the leader of the Dominica Sperm Whale Project. He's been studying the sperm whales out in Dominica for 15 years. And he has this amazing repository of knowledge about what's going on in these communities. And that's why we collaborate with him. That's why he's our team member to try to build the project that we're doing out here in Sri Lanka. We want to be able to compare and contrast what we're seeing here with the animals that are in Dominica, with everything they know out there, OK? So this is the part I'm asking you to please stay on the down low about, because unpublished information. So here, you can see these are some of the sperm whales from Dominica. We name our sperm whales with good reason, usually. Usually based on the patterns that you see, it's, it's a fun game that we play, but I just want you to see that, that these, the trailing flukes, uh, the trailing edges or the top edge of the fluke are really tattered and torn, right? Really characteristic, big markings, permanent markings, they won't change, so this is really useful for us to take one, that one picture that I need to take, and um, there you go, I know who it is, right? I can compare it with whoever is in our catalog. Let me take you to the Sri Lankan sperm whales. They don't like making it easy. <laughs> Just FYI. So these guys, not quite so tattered and torn. There are markings if you look carefully, and uh, photo ID is all about attention to detail. You feel a bit like Sherlock Holmes, okay? But what you can see here is pretty cute, right? We also have started naming them. But so, so the question was, why is it that our whales don't have these aren't so ripped up. What's happening here? So it turns out in Dominica, the main predator of the sperm whale is the pilot whale. The pilot whales go after the sperm whales, they grab onto the tail, and that's how it gets shredded. We have pilot whales here. This is a picture of a pilot whale I took in Sri Lanka. So what's going on? Well, maybe by the, culturally, the, spur, the, the pilot whales in Sri Lanka just aren't looking to eat sperm whales. Maybe that's what it is. And it's two different ocean basins. 
the animals are adapted to do totally different things. And that's what we have to learn to understand. We think of the ocean as this one con continuous space, but there's a lot of separation that happens within it for various reasons. We, have, we know that out here in Sri Lanka, um, orcas or killer whales tend to predate on sperm whales. But again, probably not as much as we think because we don't really see the markings on their bodies. So maybe they are actually at the top of the food chain. Maybe they are the top predator. And these are some of the questions we want to unravel through our research. Now in the Dominica po population, as I said, the most basic unit of sperm whales is the maternal unit, which is the grandmother, the, mo the mother or the daughters, and their kids, okay? And so um, you can have, uh, in Dominica, they found that on average, a unit will have six individuals, small units. They stick together for life. They're genetically related, okay? So throughout their lives, you'll see these six kind of moving together. The young, the young males, though, will mature and move off, and I'll get into that in a bit. But just so you know, they tend to stick together. Out here in Sri Lanka, over the 10 days that we did our research, we found our, the sperm whale group that we followed, there were 36 individuals, okay? So there could be... It could be one single unit, they could all be genetically connected, or it could be several units coming together. Now, you can have several units coming together, even in Dominica, but they come together for maybe a day or two, and then they separate back into their smaller units, and they do their thing. But here, 10 days, and we're seeing this 36, just moving up and down in a very restricted area. Okay, So something exciting is happening here. And the fact that they remained in the same area for 10 days is also mind-blowing. Because in Dominica, they'll use a cer certain area for a couple of days, and then they move on to some other area, okay? So what is happening? Definitely something magical. As far as I'm concerned, our waters, this is where it's at. This is why I do what I do here. And I told you that they're, they're maternal groups. So how do we know that they're all females? Well, ge the genders, the males are bigger than the females, typically in sperm whales. But as you can imagine, that's not the best way to tell the difference at sea. Uh, you know, you can have um, a young male that's small and therefore you assume it's a female, which would be inaccurate. But here I've got, uh, this is the dorsal fin of a sperm whale, so that's that fin on the back. And if you look closely on the top of it, you can see this like white and this like kind of like rubbed up area, almost like your elbow, you know, a little bit of a rougher skin. And it's what we call callus. It's a callus that comes onto their dorsal fins. And this is typical of older females, okay? Older, more mature females will have these calluses on their dorsal fin. So that's one way that we can tell these are females and older females. Now, what's really interesting is that in Dominica, they don't see these calluses much. But here, with those 36 individuals we were looking at, the vast majority had calluses. Now, the question then becomes, does that mean that the sperm whales in our waters are older? Or... Are calluses really indicative of age, right? So again, mystery is everywhere for me. This is like another lifelong journey, which is exciting. I mean, I think it's fantastic. But all these questions just gush to mind when I see these things. And we wonder, like, what is going on? The dorsal fins on the sperm whales in Sri Lanka are bigger than the ones in Dominica. In fact, my friend Shane, who spent 15 years with sperm whales here and worked in the Galapagos and in the Azores, he was like, the sperm whales here are huge. Our females are the size of the males that come into the waters in those places. And they, we had one male come in during our, the time we were at sea, and that male was ginormous. What's happening? Is there just a lot of food? Are they just eating better food? So many questions for us to ask. And that's why I say we have to look after these populations because we can't, and we can't take them for granted because we don't know anything about them yet, right? And it's so important for us to keep understanding and unraveling so we can start to look after them better. And when you have sperm whale groups, you have, you know, calves in them. And I said, as I said, sperm whales dive for long periods of time. They can be gone for an hour, an hour and a half. The babies can't hold their breath for so long. So what you have is... The, the, they'll all kind of dive, and then the baby will pop up because it's really tired, it can't hold its breath that long. And if it's just on its own, it would be vulnerable to predators. So what sperm whales do in these little groups, in these um, families or these units, is that they cycle their dives. They stagger them. 
So there's always some females at the surface, so they can be there to look after the calves. Babysitting. We think only we have babysitters, animals have babysitters too, okay? And this is important because that we are seeing this caring, this caring not just for your own young, but caring for someone else's young. You might be genetically related, and sometimes you might not be, but that is important. Care is important. And, and so we see this communal childcare, which I think is really interesting because we can't take for granted that these animals are doing this. And, and the thing in Sri Lanka is that it was very interesting. So these 36 individuals you saw were all mature adults, okay? We didn't see any calves in this group. I have seen calves in Sri Lanka before, but in this group, I didn't see any calves. And yet, they were doing this cycling behavior. It doesn't make sense because if you don't have calves to look after, Typically, you'd think that all dive at once, and then they'll just all come back at once. That's what you'd assume. But for whatever reason, they're cycling. So what is it? Is it just that they feel they have to guard each other from uh, a threat at the surface? Is there something that they're worried about, that they have to keep a lookout through these dive cycles? So some really interesting things to kind of unravel. Okay, if we talk about sperm whales, look at them. They're pretty amazing animals. You might be able to see little teeth on the bottom uh, rung of their mouths. The reason they don't have teeth on both, I should have said, is that they, can't, they eat squid. So all they do is they catch the squid and then they swallow it. So they don't need to chew, right? But what we're looking at here is what the largest nose in the marine kingdom, okay? One third of the animal is basically head, of which the vast majority is its nose. With elephants, we all know they have trunk, biggest nose in the tr uh, in the lab, in on, on land, right? And they also these two species also have the biggest brains in their respective environments. Sperm whales have the biggest brains in the marine kingdom, and elephants have the biggest brains on land. And as a result, they have very complex social organization. But of course, as you know, they might have both have big noses, but they use them for different purposes. The elephant, uh, apparently its trunk is 100, can be 120 kilograms. That's nuts. Yes, 120 kilograms. That's heavy. I mean, that's like <laughs> twice me at least. Um, so th 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 it's really big, but th they can do these tiny little things. They can pick up crumbs. They can uh, smell with it, right? So they, it's very tactile. They use it as an extra limb almost. But of course, sperm whales, they can't. They can't smell. You, smell is not an important sense in the ocean. And clearly, they're not picking anything up with their noses. So their noses are actually the largest sound-producing organ in the world, OK? They produce the sounds, that cacophony of noise that you were listening to earlier, that is produced actually in the nose, OK? Which, I, which is mad, right? Mad. <laughs> Nobody else looks like it's mad, but it's mad, OK? And with. Elephants, now we're talking about maternal groups. If we are comparing sperm whales and elephants further, elephants also have maternal groups, right? We know that. They use infrasonic sound that travels vast distances to keep their groups together. They use touch and smell and they rub each other. This is all part of their communication, right? Sperm whales also click over large distances. In fact, they also use, uh, they're very tactile. They'll caress each other with their flippers. They'll caress each other with their jaws. They communicate through touch. And they also communicate through clicks, like you heard earlier. But specifically, a click called a coda. A coda is a pattern series of clicks, very, very specific, that they use only for communicating with their maternal groups. So they also use sounds that are long range, they travel long distances, in the same way that elephants do. Both have maternal, this whole matriarchal societies, okay? They live in completely different environments, but they've adapted these similar things in, in the way that they live. And elderly elephants and elderly sperm whales don't leave their maternal units. They stick around right through to the end of their lives. Why? Even past their reproductive period. Why do that? Well, because they're repositories of knowledge. They're kept there. It's not just a reproductive function, but they have learned so much stuff over their lives, and it's all about social learning. It's about passing that knowledge down to the young. It's like it's about passing that knowledge down to the young who can pass it to each other. 
And that's what's really important to remember. With species like sperm whale, they have what we call culture. Culture is defined by this act of social learning, passing on knowledge. And we see that. And what happens is these units have their own little cultures. So this genetically connected small unit will have its own culture. It'll have, its, uh, it'll have a common call that we'll share with everyone in that region, but each unit has a different call as well that's characteristic. It's almost to say, hey, you're one of me, right? Yes, we are sperm whales, but we belong to unit A, right? Kind of neat. Also, these smaller groups feed on slightly different things from each other. So what happens if we don't look after these populations at the smallest level, if we're not conserving them at this cultural, this unit level, we wipe out cultures in our ocean. And we have to think about what is the most meaningful way to protect species. It's not blanket protection over oceans. It's not sometimes even just blanket protection over a region. It's specific needs that each of these smaller units have. And that's why studying them and understanding them is so important. With elephants, we know that they, the calves will suckle from other members in the group. It could be for lactation, but it could be just for comfort. Certainly in sperm whales, they do that. Calves will go and suckle on other females, not necessarily getting any milk, but it's a comfort thing, right? These are highly complex social groups, highly developed animals. And just like I was talking about the cycling behavior, right? When not everyone dives at the same time because they have to look after the calves. In the same way, with elephants, if they're all on a long trek and the baby goes, I'm tired, I'm just gonna, just gonna lie down. Because you know how baby elephants do that, right? They just roll and that's it. Everybody stops, right? They're not gonna move on, they're not gonna leave that young. And at the same time, the mother may say, mother has to go off and feed and aunt is gonna stick around right here, right? Because looking after your family is important. Genetically, it's important, right? To keep your genes going through. And both these species, have, they create these defensive formations when there are predators around. So um, with elephants, we know they're very protective. I'm sure all of you have seen, you know, they'll have the little babies tucked between the legs. The baby's kind of like there, really wanting to race out, but getting in trouble for trying to. With sperm whales, what they do is, and they've documented in some places, is they form what we call a marguerite formation, okay? So what it is, is the baby will be in the middle. Say there's a predator coming to attack. Think about a wheel with spokes, a bicycle wheel, okay? Baby is right in the middle. All the adults, all the female adults, will now face towards the baby, like the spokes in a wheel, and their tails are around the edge. So if a predator comes close, they flick their tails really hard to chase the predators away. So they form these like defense, they have these defense, these walls that they create to keep the predators away from the young. So protection is a really big thing. And then if we talk about the males, right? So these are, I said, the maternal groups, the males, young males will mature and off they go, right? They go beyond the areas where we see the females and they, uh, what we call roving males, they hang around in loose-knit groups or loose-knit bachelor groups. Certainly with sperm whales, they may occasionally meet up with another couple of males, hang out for a very short period of time. Elephants, the same thing. They'll meet other bachelors for a very short period of time and then off they go. They go off on their own. When they're ready to mate, they come back to where these females are, male elephants, do this must rumble to say, hey, hey, ladies, I'm ready. I'm here, I'm ready. Advertisement calls, right? With uh, sperm males, they also have an advertisement call. The males do what we call a clang. It's an incredibly loud, incredibly uh, powerful click sound that they generate. And again, that's when they come back and they're like, hey, ladies, I'm back. I'm ready, right? They're sourcing out their mates. It's all about making sure that you, your genes keep flowing, right? So why not? So they have got these similar adaptations in, these, um, in, the, in terms of how they advertise themselves. And in fact, with these two species, no other animals have been as ecologically successful as elephants and sperm whales in such a variety of habitats, okay? So sperm whales go down to the dips. They go right across our oceans. Elephants also have learned to use a lot of different habitats. We're seeing so much similarity and they're two separate species that live in totally different ecosystems, okay? 
And just to wrap up, what I want to say to you is think about it this way. The impact you and I have on these populations, on these species, these three species and every other species around us. Imagine you are hosting a Sunday lunch for your family. You're sitting there, having a great time. Everyone's sitting around laughing, you're eating ice cream. And then a stranger comes crashing through the front door, playing really loud music, throwing garbage everywhere, just no, unannounced, just crashing through your house. You're really scared, you're really afraid. It smells, it's noisy, you're stressed out. This is exactly what we do. We don't think about it this way. But the ocean is the home of the whales, of the fish, of the dolphins, of the sharks, of the rays. When we go in there, we're going as uninvited guests. We're walking in, chucking garbage everywhere. We're making noise. We're not worried about what's going on. All three species I've talked about are threatened by the same thing. Pollution, habitat destruction, whales, ship strikes. We get elephants getting killed by trains. We get entanglement for uh, uh, whales. Elephants ingest garbage, right? So what I want you to think about today is that if we want to be respected in our homes, we have to learn to respect these animals in theirs. Thank you. There's some mics upstairs, uh, so if we can get the mics through, so we might need some help in passing the mics. So please, hands up for anyone. And they will die. Like you find them on the beaches, dead. And when they cut, cu cut their bodies open to see why they are dead, it's all filled with just polythene and plastic yeah. and different things people throw away. Yeah. And like I went whale watching once. What I saw was the whale was actually running away, practically running away from the boats. I mean, like we had, we were going in this huge cruise ship, but we, even with the cruise ship, there were about 10, 15 more ships just following that one whale. Yeah. I mean, it would have been stressed out. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. We have a wise man in the audience here, guys. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> this is what we need more of. We need kids who are speaking out and who realize that there's a problem. Don't. Hide the truth from them. When they go out whale watching, don't just point out the beauty of the animals. Point out the problems. That's exactly right. What we do when we go out, we don't think about it. The boats, we want the best view. We want the best photograph. And we have iPhones. So how on earth are you getting the best photograph unless they're really close, right? I know it sounds like a joke, but it's so true, right? It's not necessary. Can I just tell you the best experiences you will ever have with these animals is if you just find an area like that, switch off your engine and watch. I have seen some of the most magnificent things just by being invisible. And that's what we should all strive to do. And it's so true. There's pollution, whales are dying because of plastic, elephants, right? What happens when they ingest this stuff? What does it do? It fills their stomachs. So they think they're full, but they're getting no nutrition. And then they die. They get less internal lacerations in their stomach because of hard plastics. We have to be more conscious of our usage of these things. It's not just about sharing the stories. It's about walking the talk. We all have a role to play in the end. Yeah. All right. We got a little nangi here. What's a funny thing? You got a mic. Yeah. Point you closed with. Uh, Sri Lanka, being where it is geographically, is at a major point in the crossing of uh, shipping lines. Mm -hmm. And with the port city coming up, there's going to be enormous increase in cruise liners, etc., coming. What would be the consequences of that on the whales and similar species? Because Sri Lanka is also the south. The seas south of Sri Lanka is also a pathway for whales, in my limited understanding. So, what is it that can be done to protect them in the context of projected massive increase in shipping? Yeah, in that's Sri great. Lanka. Some of you might economic advantage of them coming and traveling through the areas where there are aggregations of whales because the whales are feeding there, right? So as part of the proposal we put together based on science, we put recommendations together and we said that if we shift those shipping lanes 20 nautical miles offshore, 
it will take them out of the area where there is intense um, ship, uh, whale uh, like behavior, right? Um, and also beyond that, it's a, it becomes a, it's a safety concern. So a lot of the shipping industry has com commented on the fact that small boats are small fishing fleets. They don't always have lights, and in the night, it's very hard to navigate the waters, and they have safety concerns. So for various reasons, they have automatically started to shift offshore, but it's something that we have been talking to the government about for a long time. Now, there's 10% of the vessels that will come into our ports that will use the inner shore waters, and that's something we said we need to do more research on to really understand how we can tackle that. But certainly, the boats that are not coming in, we're only getting pollution. We're getting no, no other benefit from them. So we do have to start thinking exactly about that. When the shipping increases even further, what are we doing to look after these resources that we are exploiting for tourism dollars? This is my moment of fame, guys. I got a question. Very important person coming. Hi. What's your question? You can talk into the mic. Have you ever swam with a whale? That's a great question, and my answer is no. And that is because these whales, they don't, it's like this, like imagine you're walking on the road and someone keeps coming up to you and they keep doing this and you don't know this person and they're just always trying to come and look at you like this and touch you. It's not nice, no? You wouldn't like that, no? And that's what happens. So blue whales especially, they don't like people coming too close. And so because of that, I let them do their thing and I do my thing and I try not to bother them like that. Thank you for asking the question. How do blue whales get so big when they eat? Because these, these uh, little shrimp have so many friends and they like being together, and so it's really easy. And the shrimp don't swim away. They can't swim. Can you swim? Do you swim? Do you go for swimming classes? Well, shrimp can't swim, whether you can or not. They can't swim. They just kind of sit in the water. So they're not rushing away when the whale comes to eat them. And so, yeah, they get eaten. And that's why we have giant blue whales. Nice question. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Are blue whales so You're welcome? It's a little small, shorter than yours, but <laughs> I'm hoping I have one. Um, so I'm going to. So remember when I was talking about the sperm whales? I had so many questions I didn't have answers for, and I want to start to investigate some of that. Um, I want to also keep growing the blue whale work that we do, so you know, trying to protect the blue whales better. Uh, we're working to understand what's going on with the whale watching industry. So just like Garrick over here said that the boats get, um, get too close and they're harassing the whales, we're trying to try to change that also a little bit. But we also try, we do a lot of education work. So we build programs, we take uh, university students out to uh, snorkel and learn about the marine environment. We go to schools. Um, I'm trying to change the world one child at a time, and I want at the end of my life, at the end of my future, which I hope is still long, I want to, I want everyone on the planet to talk about the oceans at least once a day. And that's my goal. So that's when I think I've re reached my future. Me. Asha, thank you. Um, I, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't a place here in Sri Lanka where all these wonderful amount of information available yeah. or the lack of information. I totally agree. These are spaces that we need to create. <clears throat> Anyone wants to fund, these are dreams that I do have. So like, you know, ocean swell, just come to me. I'm sure WNPS is cursing me right now. But, uh, but yeah, certainly I think we need to create more spaces. And also I want to try to help the Natural History Museum to ramp up. I mean, they have this amazing blue whale skeleton and there's so much they can do in that space. And uh, I'd like to help them to try to develop some of that too. Um, so we have other plans that, I, I, every day I have a new dream. So if anyone wants to fund us, we have lots of things to be funded. And there's, okay, there's a question over there, yeah. Uh, I have read that, um, 
whales are evolved from uh, small mammals and which they have adapted to water. Uh, how can they become so big while they are very small? So, okay, uh, that's a good question. Actually, the closest living relative of a whale, does anybody know the answer to this? You know the answer, what is it? You win, hippopotamus. Where's the gasp in the audience? <laughs> so what happened was, they, what happened was evolutionary, evolutionarily, they, we, everything started in the water, came onto land, and then from land, we went back into the water. And actually, their ancestors were, so like hippos, these even-toed ungulate and pachycetus and stuff, which were smaller mammals. They grew because once they went into the ocean, they didn't have to, um, they didn't have to share their food with anyone. So they didn't have to compete. There was lots of food in the ocean because now everything else is like fighting for food on land. And these ones are like, you know what, this is great. Look at all this space, there's all this food. So they had access to so much more food that they were able to grow bigger. And the other thing is, <coughs> when you're in water, water has the amazing ability to support your body, right? So you can actually, like when you're on land, sometimes, you know, for example, if, you, if you're walking around, after a while your legs get tired and stuff. If you're floating on water, that doesn't happen because your body is supported it takes longer. Your body is supported by water. And that itself is really helpful for animals getting bigger. We can never have an animal the size of a blue whale on land because it could just not physically cope with the weight of its own body, basically, if that makes sense. Um, and if you want to know about why blue whales got so enormous, Google it. I have a video. Um, it's actually titled Why Blue Whales Are So Enormous. Um, and I'm a Muppet in it, so you can see my twin Muppet in the video and learn a bit more about that. Now, human beings... I don't know where I'm looking. Oh, sorry. Human beings are now eating krill. Is that a threat to the food of the... Yeah, so it's, it is problematic because there's multiple reasons. One thing is, of course, it's the food of the, uh, a lot of whales that go, especially there exploiting it in the Antarctic and stuff. And a lot of whales, uh, a lot of um, whales go there during their cycle, their <coughs> migration cycle to go and feed. Why it's also more of a problem is as with global warming, we have less sea ice. And this krill tends to feed on algae that grows under sea ice. So as you have less sea ice, melting sea ice, there's less space for this krill to grow and pr proliferate. So we are now getting less numbers of krill as well. So now we are starting to compete with an important food source for these animals. So it, it is, technically, it is problematic. Populations, they do go down to, say, Antarctica. And like I said, krill that they feed on feeds on algae, which is tiny little plants that grow underneath ice. So as you have more global warming, you're having less ice being formed. And as a result, there's less space for this krill, so you're having less krill, right? Um, on top of that, you now if you think about the in 20% of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are the tiny, tiny, tiny plants in our oceans that are base of every single food chain. If we have less plants, then we have less of everything else because everything depends the plant is the bottom of the food chain and all the trees, you'll have less of everything else because we depend on the trees for various reasons, right? Also, when it comes to uh, phytoplankton in our environment, obviously that could have problems in the long term. Oh, great, that's great. So yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't say no. I think we need more of it, but it's how do we, we there's a massive gap between I mean, the thing is we do paper parks really well, right? We declare spaces all the time. And this is a global problem. It's not just in Sri Lanka. But enforcement is something we need to get behind. And there are a lot of issues in the enforcement, and I've been talking to uh, a lot of people. But that said, the Navy at the moment ha is doing amazing work. They are apprehending dynamite fishers. They are basically, um, you know, confiscating dynamite. And that's making a difference. And if we can continue to support our military
community organizations that are engaging and doing positive work, celebrate them and also talk about it because I think we don't talk about enough, enough about what they are doing and what they're trying to do for us. So I think that's another way we can start to celebrate them and support them so we can together try to make the change. Let's take a question from upstairs. Hi, I want to ask how many babies can a uh, sperm whale and a uh, blue whale put at per one time? Super question. I can't see you, but you sound very intelligent. Um, they have one baby at a time. So that's also part of the problem. Sperm whales will have one baby maybe every five years. So their population, if we keep uh, killing them, if we kill two whales every year, this population can't grow. And that's a huge problem. And a lot of the time, these large mammals, that's one of the issues is that they only produce mm -hmm. one baby at a time. Yeah, they invest a lot of energy in making sure that baby is strong and can you know, become an adult. And as a result, um, th we, we have to be really careful about how we protect these animals so that their populations can grow into the future. Got it? I think the last two questions, guys. Uh, this one here and one over there. He's here to stay. I also want people to be enthralled by these amazing creatures. But it's not practical for us to have 58 boats surrounding one whale at a time, right? And I think, and that's actually what happens sometimes off the south coast, right? And 58 boats, but I think the travel industry has an important role to play. Travel industry has to lay down the rules. Travel, there are rules, we may not know it, but you need to vocalize it and you say, you, here's what happens, you can't get this close, this is how your boat should approach. If you have a problem, please report it to us. Please be vocal. Please talk about the companies that are breaking these rules. If there's a company that doing, that's doing well, by all means celebrate it. For what we have and say, you know what, this is my country. I want my kids to enjoy this resource. If you see someone violating rules, speak up, right? Don't think, what can I do to save the environment? You can, you have a voice. Okay, the last question. Yeah. I <laughs> uh, so how do you become a marine biologist? First of all, if that's what you want to do, never stop dreaming that you can do it, right? Second thing, listen to other people when they give you advice, but if it's your dream, never stop dreaming that you can do it, okay? And ask your family to support you. Uh, you can learn about the marine environment easily from around you, but like learn and share. Because you know what? That's what we need more of. We need more people who are excited about the ocean and who go and tell their friends about it. Go and tell your teacher about this stuff. That's how you become an ocean hero at your age. And then as you grow older, you can go to school and study it. And then you can start thinking about what exciting questions you want to answer. But right now, you are already an ocean hero. If you go and tell one person about one thing you learned today. And that's the start of your journey. And that's where your dream will begin. Okay? And thank you, Asha, for the awesome lecture. Uh, can I call upon Sriyan to share a small token of appreciation? Yeah, before, before I do that, I just want to thank a whole bunch of people in the WNPS who put this event together. Sorry we couldn't accommodate you more uh, wonderfully and comfortably, but uh, this is all we can afford. That big hall is way too expensive. <laughs> Uh, I want at least members to sign up today, right? That's how you can help Asha to fulfill the dream, become members of any wildlife conservation related community. These people together and we really appreciate your presence. Asha will be around till about 10 p.m. for questions outside. <laughs> Actually, can, can you do me a favor? So don't forget to support that. There's a whole team who's out here. They'll be around. Don't forget what the name of my organization is. And it's waterproof. You can put it on your water bottle. <laughs> you can come and get one from me. And if you have questions.